ever come to a church to sit and hear a man preach out of them. I've always been suspicious of them. Because I know myself. I'm suspicious of myself. <laughs> and I've always been suspicious of people, you know, that could sit under teaching but couldn't sit under preaching. And you know why that is? Because in preaching, you get a, you get a certain uh, aggressive blast that just fans your hair <laughs> and fans your face that you need. And to my dire nail, I'll never understand why folks run from it and don't appreciate it. I appreciate all I can get of it. I never get enough of it. I'll get in the morning, turn on the radio, and hear some homeless preacher, you know. just I like Jim McGraw over here at uh, this place over here across the way. Well, he don't know what he's doing. <laughs> but, but he believes in it, brother. And he'll come down, boy. He'll come down hard. And you need that. What's that got to do with the text? Oh, yeah. Uh, he for a moan vineyard, but the other, the other vineyard, but moan vineyard are not kept. A preacher has to watch his prayer life and his spiritual life and his, to see if he's keeping up with what he's preaching. Now, you've heard me many times say this to you. You've heard me say, well, um, I hope God, I have to ask you to sell out, you know, I ask you to lay everything you got me all over the Lord, give God everything you have. And then you hear me say, uh, uh, by the grace of God, or you better pray, a Lord willing, or God give me grace. Now, I always stick that in there because I know something. I know that in certain cases, when you try to give God everything and sell out all the way, if God doesn't give you some special grace and do something special for you, you can't do it. You can't do it. You can't make it. And I know this, too. When I say, put the Lord first, which I say all preachers say it. Now, let's just face it. All preachers say it. Say, put the Lord first. Well, all preachers say that. But did you ever stop to think what's involved in that thing? And many of you just says, put him first, put him first. If God, if he isn't Lord of all, he's not Lord at all. And go through the cliche, you know. But boy, did you ever stop to think what's involved in that thing? There's a, there's a man one time named Job, and before the Lord got through with him, he lost everything he had, including his health. What if the Lord just came out of here right now and just stepped right in here and said, Lovest thou me more than these? And you said, Yea, Lord, thou knowest all things. I knowest I love thee. And he said, I'm going to ask something from you. And you said, What's that? And he said, I want your help. I want you to spend the next 30 years in the hospital. How's that? And see, when a preacher preaches, he's got he to keep that in his mind. And if he don't keep that in his mind, he just shake redeemers, praise, not that one, but Wesley's. It goes, uh, oh, for a thousand tongues to sing my great redeemer's praise, my great read. Got a lot of, you know, uh, uh, and that's a good one. And then that one, that one about that Wesley wrote that goes, uh, he left his father's home above, so free, so infinite was his grace, and emptied himself of all but love, and bled for Adam's helpless race. Amazing grace, how can it be? But, oh, my God, it found out me. Did you ever hear that one? That's a tremendous thing. You get those two into this one here, but I can't remember how this one starts. Tell me, thy shepherd, well, to abide with thy flock, to feed them in man. Now, that's the second verse. But it's, it's on this thing here. It's a real good one. It's one of those old ones, you know. If you get them written before 1800, they're real good. Before 1800, they, they, only, they only write two kinds of hymns. And one of them is, I love him, and he loves me, and he died for me, and I'm trusting him. His blood is shed for me, and I'm trusting his blood, and some that day I'm going to see him. That's one kind. And the other kind is, I'm going to fight, and I'm going to get in there and give out and sell out and put up a battle, and God's going to help me, and I'm going to overcome and whip the world and the flesh and the devil by his grace, and let's go, see? And all that stuff written for 1800 like that. And then you get up uh, around 1900, they all begin to change. And you got two kinds of hymns now, just about, you know. And one kind of hymn is, have faith and trust and trust and have faith. And if you have faith, you can trust, and he's a... Uh, Put step away and he walk by and hold your hand if you'll trust him and have faith to believe that you can hold his hand if he walks beside you. You know, that's one of them. And then the other kind they have today is he's in the trees and the mountains and the bees and the birds and the bushes and the hills. And I, and I see a bowler, I think about a valine or something, you know, and they're all fouled up. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> I had one of them get up there one time sing some song or something about what I 
something about seeing a big old granite mountain. I think of his love for me. I don't remind anybody of his love for me. I'm about the hill of beans, man. And they're just going on on, you know. And he's in the little baby. Yes, he's in the little baby, you know. And he's in your eyes and all that mess. And those kind of songs, they have, they have to do with a pantheistic emotionalism. They have nothing to do with a militant blood atonement. And that develops the same kind of Christian. Well, we'll get off that. Uh, seven. Oh, tell me, tell me, O oh thou whom my soul loveth. All right, the Christian soul should love the Lord Jesus Christ. O oh, thou whom my soul loveth. Well, if you love, you know what the verse means. And if you love somebody, you want to be with them. And if you love somebody, you miss them when they're not there. And if you love somebody, you like to hear them talk. And if you love somebody, you stick up for the friend. If you love somebody, you fight against their enemies. And if you love somebody, you take on their enemies and take their side in the matter. And if you love somebody, you hate to see them evil spoken of. You don't believe a bad report or rumor on them, and you defend them. And if you love somebody, you have their best interest at heart. So if you love the Lord Jesus Christ, all those things should be true of you. You ought to be interested in his enemies, and you ought to be interested in fighting against them. And you ought to be interested in his friends, you ought to be interested in seeking them out and have fellowship with them. And you ought to defend his cause. When you hear something bad about him or about his word, just forget it. Just turn up your nose out. And uh, you ought to want to be with him, and uh, you ought to want to hear him talk. All right, seven. Tell me, O thou whom my soul loveth. And that's the Lord. Where thou feedest, well, now where he eats, but where his flocks eat, where he feeds the flock. O thou whom my soul loveth, tell me where thou feedest, where thou makest thy flock to rest at noon. Now that's uh, the hottest part of the day. So when the hottest part of the day comes, then uh, you want to rest in him. And David used to say, he leadeth me beside the... Uh, still waters, make me lie down, green pasture, lie down, rest. Uh, you rest the same place where you eat. Did you ever notice that about a sheep? His, his bed is his table. Did you ever notice that? I mean, a sheep eats the same place where he sleeps. So the Christian feeds the same place where he rests. And that's here. This is the pasture. Uh, where thou feedest, where thou makest thy flock to rest at noon. In the hottest part of the day, then you rest in him and rest in his word. Tell me, O thou, O my soul lover, where thou feedest, where thou makest thy flock to rest at noon, or she won't be fed. And you can't get fed unless you find out where the shepherd's flock is. And the good shepherd feeds his flock. And you can't get fed just at any old stall or menagerie or zoo or sheep coach you walk into or any barnyard. And so she says, I want to know where they're getting fed, so I'm go get fed too. Tell me, O thou whom my soul loveth, where thou feedest, where thou makest thy flock to rest at noon. For why should I be as one that turneth aside by the flocks of thy companions? And she said, I came to rest and came for food, and why should I get turned aside from it and turned away? Or why should I be as one that turneth aside by the flocks of thy companions? Now, is that, is that the language of your heart? I mean, is that how you feel about it? How about the folks that... Uh, Are they any happier than you are? Are they any safer than you are? Uh, you take the flocks where they feed them the Saturday evening post, you know, in Life and Time magazine and uh, Playboy and Esquire and uh, Look and U.S. New World Report and all that others to pray filth. Are those folks any better off than you are? Are they any happier? Are they any safer? Do they get any better food? You know, that's, that's garbage. Good for pigs, you know, good for pigs. But, you know, sheep, they don't care for that. Uh, sheep like something that'll assist them. And that's the pasture. And you know something? I've seen sheep going across a piece of ground that, honest to goodness, it looked just as flat as a, as a bowling alley as far as vegetation was concerned, or a skating rink. And that old sheep was out there, bent over, and I could see his mouth working, you know, to get something. And later on, I went out there and looked at it where they'd been eating. And here were little blades of grass about that high. There one of them here, one of them over here, one of them over here, back behind a rock. Now, I learned something about studying that thing, and I said, my, if a sheep can get sustenance where no animal in the world can get it. I don't believe a chicken could have lived off some of those places those sheep were grazing. And you know what that tells me? That tells me that a Christian can get sustenance where the world can't get it. 
And the world comes this book and looks at that book and says, well, now, what in the world is that? Uh, where, how did Cain get his wife? How could all the animals got into the ark? Uh, how could this, Christ didn't come up from the dead. He must have fainted and come back to, and this mistake over here, and this contradicts here. What's a big old list of names there? You can't pronounce them. Oh, what a dull book. <laughs> and you know what looks like a barren wasteland to an ungodly person is a pasture for a sheep. And he just gets there and just grazes and grazes and grazes. Uh, seven. For why should I be as one that turneth aside by the flocks of thy companions? And then uh, somebody answers her. I don't know who it is, but it must be the king from what follows in verse 9 and 10. And in verse 8 he says, If thou know not, you don't know where to go to get fed. If thou know not, O thou fairest among women. All right, thou fairest among women is plainly a reference to the bride of Christ. Look at verse 15. Behold, thou art fair, my love. Behold, thou art fair. 16, behold, thou art fair. Uh, chapter 2, verse 10, come away, my love, my fair one. Chapter 2, 13, arise, my love, my fair one. Chapter 4, verse 1, behold, thou art fair, my love. Behold, thou art fair. Now, that doesn't mean just mediocre, see, like we use it. We say it's good, bad, and fair. <laughs> it doesn't mean like that. It doesn't mean uh, you're passable. Uh, it means uh, fair in the set. The old English means uh, light complexion in the sense of beauty. Uh, let me show you one like it. Uh, go back to Genesis chapter, uh, yeah, Genesis 12, uh, Scripture with Scripture, Genesis 12, verse 14. They say fair in the Bible. They don't mean uh, just got by. Uh, Genesis 12, 14, it came to pass that when Abram was come into Egypt, the Egyptians beheld the woman that she was very fair. The prince also of Pharaoh saw her and commanded her before Pharaoh, and the woman was taken to Pharaoh's house. And uh, Sarah gets here, and Abraham gets harem, scare him, and uh, Sarah gets kicked out of the harem and is returned to Abraham and leaves. But when he says she's fair, he meant she's good-looking. Now, Sarah at this time, and this passage is 65 years old, so she must have been some looker of a Marlena Dietrich or a Joan Crawford or something. But uh, then you've got to remember back in those days, Abraham lived to be 175 years old. So let's see, uh, that put her at 160. Uh, that'd be, uh, what, 60 to 160? I haven't got any idea. It's, it's under a half. It's under a half. So uh, if the days of our years now are three score and ten, seventy, then Sarah today was the equivalent of a woman who was not 35 yet, about 30. So that's how that works out. All right, Song of Solomon, chapter 1, verse uh, 8. If thou know not, O thou fairest among women, go thy way forth by the footsteps of the flock. In plenty words, if you want to go get fed, go with sheep. Don't go with the dogs and the pigs and the skunks. Go with the sheep. And this world is looking for a handout from the bankrupt lunch counter of this world, and they're following the bats and the vultures and the beetles and the animals and the buzzards all around trying to get a handout, and they can't feed your soul. They can jar your head off and loosen your brain cells and blast out your eardrums with a stereophonic high-fidelity tweeter roof or whatever the world it is. They can blow your brains out, you know, and get a, what they call it, uh, bowed out through the head, you know, like you had air shot through your head, but they can't feed you. Did you ever notice, uh, did you ever notice how all the things in the world, uh, this is just something I noticed I've been saved, but do you ever notice how everything in the world kind of builds you like this, and you get up like this, and then you get right to the top, and then, uh, it's like that, you know, and then what happened to it, you know, it's just like a, it's just like a cloud just went in front of your face and just vanished. Have you ever noticed how television shows that way, you know? Oh, boy, sitting up all night, watch that boob, you know, and that thing is getting more excited, more excited, more excited, and gets right at the end, you know, and you can hardly stand it, you know, and comes to the end, and then, boom, you know, and there's that tube there with snow going across it, you know, and some guy coming on, and try one of these, and blip, blip, blip up in your tummy, you know, bubbles in your tummy, and just in your forehead, and bottles and everything, and you go through all that business right there, and you say, well, what happened, you know? Well, you turn to the next one. Then you get all built up again. That thing builds up and builds up and builds up and builds up. Boy, you're just enjoying yourself, you know. Then you get right at the top and then, 
boom, the whole thing caves out again. And did you know everything in the world's like that? Uh, now I've been the gamut, and the best art is like that. And the best music is like that. And the best food is like that. And the best liquor is like that. And the best cigarettes are like that. And the best cigars are like that. And the most exhilarating experiences are like that. They're all the same. You just come out up here, see, and then, uh, you back down again. And the Word of God and, and the spiritual thing, the only things I know of, where you get built up to that peak. Like, you, you ever get in a good revival meeting, you know, or Spirit of God really working in a service? And you get up that peak up there, and then it doesn't drop. Now, it's true, it kind of fades out, you know. You try to get it back again. You have your valleys and your hills. But have you ever noticed after one of those meetings or one of those Bible studies that you don't just head off a precipice and just, uh -huh. Did you ever notice how thing kind of sticks with you? And long after you leave the building, and sometimes I've seen it last weeks after a thing like that, but it's just kind of a atmosphere you're just kind of walking around in. Like you're kind of inside a balloon. You're kind of bouncing out up and down the ground. How I many you know what I'm talking about? I know you think I'm crazy. Well, you know what I'm talking about. And you know if you're saved, if you're saved, you have access to something evidently that isn't going to fade out. And when you get saved and get in Christ, the Holy Spirit gets to you and you're part of Christ, and those spirit things start to build up, I, I've never been in one where you drop off like when you reach the end of a television show. Never. They never drop off. They kind of cling and kind of pull around with you and kind of move on, and they get kind of slow to kind of fade out. Then you get another one. You stay a long while, and then drift off, and then you get another one. You know what that shows me? You know what that shows me? One of these days, I'm just going to go along, and I'm just going to kind of fade out, see? And I'm just going to fade out, and the next kick up, <laughs> brother, it's going to last. That's what that shows me. The next one that goes up, it isn't going to fade out, see? And what the Lord does, he gives you kind of, he just gives you kind of a little taste of that, you see? You just go along, and you drift off, and then you up, and you coast a while, and then you drift off. Then you get up to death, you know, and you coast, then you drift off, and then whoop, you go... And the next time, the no drifting down, you just sustain it, brother. You're just going to stay sustained. And boy, you talk about getting turned on, brother. <laughs> getting tuned in. <laughs> Why, television, nothing wrong with side back, you know. Television, turn on, tune in, up, Chuck. <laughs> that but Mad Magazine says, turn on, tune in, throw up. <laughs> and uh, I'll tell you, when... when well, when, when in, in the Christian life, when you finally reach that last thing and hit that last thing, there's going to be no, there's going to be no diminution of it. You're going to hit that peak and sustain the peak forever. Now, do you ever think about that? Some of you folks got tired blood. Think about that. <laughs> that little boy said, "What was he said?" Oh, Alan King he said he said he woke up in the morning after a rough night. He said he had a tension headache from watching TV commercials about tension headaches. And then when he got up in the morning, he had his choice between taking two bufferin to get its double-acting, uh, soothing power to release the pain of discomfort and also settle hyperacidity or something else. Maybe that's the wrong lettuce medicine. I don't know. <laughs> or he could take two aspirins, you know, the pure aspirin, and convey nothing to upset the stomach. Or he could take two aspirin, you know, and have an ex extra-acting ingredient. He didn't know what to do, so he just took all six of them. <laughs> and he said, I got rid of my headache, man. He said, I was unconscious for about 12 hours. <laughs> All right, Song of Solomon 1, Song of Solomon 1, uh, 8. They found no not, O thou fairest among women, go thy way forth by the footsteps of the flock, and feed thy kids beside the shepherd's tent. In other words, if you want to get a good meal while you follow the flock, and feed thy kids. So we call children kids. And in uh, name or kids are baby goats or a sheep. We call them kids. And uh, mothers say, my little lamb, you know, baby, lambikin, you know. You can't get beyond a King James Bible. You just have to quote it, whether you believe it or not. Well, everybody else has to quote it. And feed thy kids beside the shepherd's tent. Uh, so she, uh, she's advised, if you want to get fed, you follow the flock, and you go to the flock where the shepherd's feeding the flock, and you get fed. Nine, I have compared thee, O my love. And this is the king is speaking. Because the king has a company of horses, and he got them from Pharaoh. Let's go back to 1 Kings. Let's see King Solomon speaking, because he got the 
forces from Egypt. Uh, now, let's see, first king. Where is it at? Anybody talks about all day long about five or six. Maybe it's later. Nine or ten. Sir? Four twenty six. Yeah, that's it. No, I didn't hear. I want the place says here it is. No, it's not. Uh, I want the place where it says he had horses brought out of Egypt. Here, it is. no, it isn't. I see Egypt down in thirty, but it's not the horses; it's something else. Well, it might be in Chronicles. It said he had horses brought out of Egypt. Well, if it's not right there. It's going to be in Chronicles. Try right around Second Chronicles, uh, chapters. There, that sounds like it. Around nine or ten somewhere. That's it. That it. Uh, first Kings ten. First Kings ten twenty eight. And Solomon had horses brought out of Egypt. And linen yarn, and king's merchants received the linen yarn at a price. Well, the bride is uh, from the world. She's drawn out of the world. So the horses come out of Egypt. What's Egypt the type of? It's the type of the world. So he says he's compared her to horses brought out of Egypt. Well, that seems quite something to compare a woman to a horse. I don't know if you consider that flattering or not. But uh, back to Song of Solomon 1 9, uh, notice what he says in the passage. In one nine, I have compared thee, O my love, to a company of horses. To a company of horses. So he's not telling his bride or his beloved, you're a horse. <laughs> Maybe just horsey. Sir? Second Chronicles 1, probably in there too. Second Chronicles 1, 16. Yeah, that's it. Second Chronicles 1, 16 again. And Solomon had horses brought up Egypt and linen yarn. The king's merchants received the linen yarn at a price, and they fetched up and brought forth of Egypt a chariot. And so he says, a company of horses in Pharaoh's chariots. So he likens her to a comfort horse, a group of horses. It isn't uh, uncommon for uh, men to use the similitude, even of a, of a fine uh, Tennessee walker or a mare. Uh, Song of Solomon 1, 9, I have compared thee, O my love, to a company of horses in Pharaoh's chariots. Uh, it's, in the, it's in the feminine. That Hebrew is Susa. You fellows know Hebrew. So it's a feminine horse. It's a mare. And a mare in Pharaoh's chariots is tied to Pharaoh's chariot. And what's Pharaoh a type of? Type of the devil. You remember Christ said, go take that, when I'm going to come to Jerusalem, go take that coat, the fool of an ass, and talk about that female donkey? I said, loose her, bring her to me. The coat cried, loose, let her loose. And that's the picture of the church, so it's feminine, and it's a picture of the sinner, so the sinner is chained. And that mare is chained to the chariot, and it's wrong chariot. It's the devil's chariot. And it just means that if you're sitting here this morning, you're on the save, you know what you're like? You're like a you're like a horse that's been hitched up to a juggernaut with Satan behind that thing, and he's got the reins in his hands, and those reins go right out over those horses, over their backs and the sides, and he got the bit, the bridle, and the bit is right in your mouth. And when the devil says, Oh boy, oh boy, you hold. And the devil says, Giddy up, you go. If he says, G or Hall, you go right or left. And he controls the rain, see, and you're, you're, you're captured and you're tied and you can't get loose. And that's a terrible thought. It means that you haul him around. See, with you? You haul him around and he has dominion over you. He runs you. And the Bible says, them that are taken captive by the devil at his will over there in, uh, first or second Timothy. Uh, Song of Solomon 1, 9. I have compared thee, O my love, to a company of horses in Pharaoh's chariots. So it's like a, the bride of Christ is like a, 
mare that's been chained to a chariot and then taken off the chariot and brought up from Egypt into the promised land. Didn't you read in the first Kings that he had horses brought up out of Egypt? See that thing? Reach out and loose that horse, bring him up, put him in the stables up in New Jerusalem. I have compared the old my love to a company of horses and Pharaoh's chariots. Well, we'll close here, and I'll give you about five ways that the church of the bright eyes can be likened to a company of horses and Pharaoh's chariots. Now, first of all, in courage. The uh, Bible speaks about the horse in the book of Job as uh, snorting among the trumpets and saying, Ha ha, and smell the sound of battle, and sees the this and that, hears the crying and shouting, and the captain is afar off, and swallows the ground with fierceness of rage. Those verses saying this, those verses saying a, a horse that's in a chariot of a king is a brave animal. And really, I don't stand that because I know nothing about horses. I just know nothing about horses. I'm suspicious of them, and they're suspicious of me, and they make me nervous, and I make them nervous. It's kind of a reciprocal shakes. And I can ride them. I've ridden, ridden, rode them, ridden them, ride them up, up, and, up and down the country. I've rode, rode, rid, ridden them, ridden them, rode them. <laughs> I don't know what to use there. What? Ridden? Thank you. Ridden. I've rid, ridden them. <laughs> and uh, up and down the country, and when I get on them, they make me nervous, I make them nervous. I never want, I was one, one yet that didn't try to throw me or get rid of me. And I've had them, I've had them, you know, rub against a tree, you know, and go under a branch. It was just even with the saddle, you know, and get the cinch strap loose and take a corner, you know, like a dragster. <laughs> I've had all kinds of experience with them. I make them behave, but I don't enjoy it. And I know dogs. I don't understand dogs. I don't understand horses. I don't know what that's got to do with it. Anyway, these horses here are supposed to be brave things. And when I consider a horse, every horse I met was nervous. And uh, I can't imagine an animal like that heading down a hill into guns and spears and swords and going through another line of horses with the riders swinging at each other and hitting each other and the horse is getting shot and kicking each other and kicking men. I can't imagine a horse looking forward to a thing like that. But I know they do. I know they do. I mean, I've seen photographs of cavalry in attack, and I've seen drawings of cavalry in attack, and paintings of cavalry in attack, and a horse, you line up and put your horses in a row, 200 or 500 abreast, and blow a trumpet, and they just about go to hell for you. I mean, they'll just go into anything you want to put them into. In that charge of the light brigade, they went down a valley that was about five miles long with cannon on the right, cannon on the left, and in front of them, and went clean down to that thing when they hit the parapet where the gunners were. There were riderless horses just going over the gun pits and into the men. No no rider on them. Now, you couldn't get them to turn back. That a horse, he, something about that charge, just boy, his blood, boy, he charges. I don't understand that. I don't. To me, a horse never impressed me as being that kind of a thing. Horses, every time I look at them, it looked like something. If you just went like that, they'd run, you know. And you can do that. You go up to a stable or barnyard and go like that. And <laughs> they run out across the road. But, you know, uh, uh, did you know Christians ought to be uh, courageous like that, like a, like a horse, uh, like a company of horses and pharaoh's chariots? And some Christians, you know, you just, you know, <laughs> off they go. <laughs> And it shouldn't shouldn't be like that, yes. Yeah. It go anything set fire. Well, haven't I seen uh, somewhere in my younger days, by the days when a man would do anything for a dollar, haven't I seen horses jump right through burning hoops, just burning and blazing? I've seen that. As sure as the world back in when I was raised in the depression, the fellow would do anything to get a dollar. You know, dollars are hard to get. And I've seen him take a cycle with a line and run around the inside of a, a big silo kind of a thing. They were vertical, the old lines sitting there, <laughs> about drunk, going around. And I've seen horses go along with big hoops lit on fire and jump right through them and bust them with the fire coming out behind them. Yeah. I guess you'd have to, yeah, I guess what I'm talking about where he's been trained especially for the job. And normally, I guess I don't guess he'd do it. But that's something there, brother. I'm not going around jump, jumping through flame and hoop. I can get away from it. Yes. Something? He'll run 
can do it. Well, you see why I don't know nothing about horses. Because <laughs> there's so much diversity of opinion about them, I don't know how you understand them at all. And I know some people love them and understand them. And uh, horseback riding is a great sport, but they well, leave me old. I can't make it. I'm glad I didn't live back in the days of a of a natural born cavalry. Because I'd never, I'd rather walk into there or, than, or <laughs> and ride in the back of one of them things. But what I'm trying to say is this: is the Christian ought to be courageous. What I'm trying to say. And when the Christian is challenged by the sound of the battle and the world and the flesh and the devil blows the trumpet, why you let the Lord blow the charge and you go into battle. Take the chariot with you. Don't stay back in the rear air. All right. And this is given picturing Christ as a king, and he's king of the Jews, and it pictures Solomon as type of Christ, Solomon the David, and it pictures the Christian as the church, a woman, because uh, the church in the New Testament is like a new woman, uh, made up of the believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, and given as uh, under this figure, uh, therefore as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands and everything. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. No man ever yet hated in his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it as the Lord the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and his bones. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined to his wife, and they shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery that I speak concerning Christ and the church. So the body of saved people, not, not a church building, not a denomination. The body of saved people are likened to a woman, and are likened to a woman who is engaged to uh, Christ to be married. And when he says church, he don't mean Baptist church, or Catholic church, or church building. He means saved people. All right, Song of Solomon, chapter 1, verse uh, 9. I have compared thee, O my love, to a company of horses in Pharaoh's chariot. What a number of ways. Uh, he likens her to a horse, a horse is a little animal. I guess that makes women animals in his sight. That's the comparison. <laughs> and likened to a mare, a female horse, in Pharaoh's chariot. Pharaoh's a type of Satan in, in Exodus. Therefore, somebody in bondage or bridled up or hitched up to the wrong chariot and... Uh, taking orders from the wrong person, and that's the condition the sinner was in before he was saved. And there's some other things about the similitude. Uh, verse 10 says, Thy cheeks are comely with rows of jewels, thy neck with chain gold. Talking about the decoration. Cheeks, rows of jewels. Oriental woman take uh, jewels and put them down here and down here and sometime in the middle of the forehead and then uh, necklaces around here. Necklace chains of gold. You see these hippies, hippies out in Berkeley, you know, imitating all that stuff. And all that stuff comes from uh, India. See, it's sham. It's oriental. And you see those uh, medallions down here. And then jewels here and here and sometimes here. And they indicate past in India. Sometimes a jewel or a mark here or here or there or on the tip of the nose or sometimes here. And to counterfeit that, it's always very fashionable in Hollywood to have a mole somewhere in your face. At least one. <laughs> All right, uh, Judges chapter 8, verse 26. Now, running these references on the ornaments. Judges 8, 26. Judges 8, 26. Uh, when Gideon is about to get some money to build this ephod with, he says this. Uh, Judges 8, 26, and I'll begin at 24. And Gideon said to them, I would desire a request of you, that you would give me every man the earrings of his prey. For they had golden earrings. That's the psalm of Peggy Lee. Because they were Ishmaelites. And they answered, We will willingly give them. And they spread a garment and did cast thereon every man the earrings of his prey. And the weight of the golden earrings that he requested was a 1,700 shekels of gold. Now, beside ornaments and collars and purple raiment that was on the kings of the men, and beside the chains that were about their camels' necks. And so the horses in Pharaoh's chariot, the Ishmaelite camels, have medallions of gold chains hung around the neck of the animal. All right, Song of Solomon, chapter 1, verse 10. Thy cheeks are comely with rows of jewels, thy neck with chains of gold. Uh, Zechariah, chapter 10, verse 3. Zechariah, chapter 10, verse 3. <clears throat> and here's the same similitude. Zechariah 10.3, Mine anger was kindled against the 
our shepherds, and I punished the goats, for the Lord of hosts hath visited his flock, there's the sheep, this time the house of Judah, and hath made them as his goodly horse in battle. So you can have the right kind of horse and the wrong kind of horse. One passage in Ezekiel says the Egyptians are not uh, spirit but flesh, and their horses are not uh, uh, spirit but flesh. So you have two kinds of horses. The type of the unsaved man is a, is a fleshy horse hitched up to Pharaoh's chariot, and the type of the saved man is like the horses that took Elijah up to heaven, their fire. Atomic scientists haven't caught on that yet, but you've got to be patient with them, give them time to catch up. All right, Song of Solomon 110. Thy cheeks are comely with rows of jewels, thy neck with chains of gold. Uh, one more reference, Zechariah 14:20, And this says when Christ comes back that uh, you're even going to have decorations of the horses that uh, consecrate the horses to God. Zechariah 14:20, And that day shall there be upon the bells of the horses holiness unto the Lord, and the pots in the Lord's house shall be like the bowl before the altar. Now, in all this, uh, these horses figure this way. You remember when David uh, captured the Syrians, he took the horses and howled them, H-O-U-G-H-E-D, hocked them. I don't mean to sell them at the hock shop. It means he took them and took a knife or a, a uh, machete and cut the hamstring there on the horses, crippled them. And somebody said, well, why do that to a horse? That's a terrible thing to do to a horse. But you see, all those horses of those captive of those people like Egyptians and Syrians and Phoenicians, those horses are all dedicated to the sun god. They're consecrated to the devil. And the Lord said, when you catch those things, you fix them so they don't haul any more chariots, which he does. The Bible says in the millennium, the horse is going to have a bridle around him here, and on the bridle it's going to say, holiness to the Lord. And that's what was written around the high priest's head in the tabernacle, which means that here's a lesson for the Christian that's plain. Uh, what you've got belongs to God and all the creation God, and if you've got any part of the creation, you ought to give it to God. Uh, the horses belong to God. Man, they don't belong to the racing stable. They belong to the Lord. Somebody said, well, why horses? Well, why do you watch cowboy movies? If that horse, see, he figures. That horse, he figures from anywhere from Exodus right slap on through anywhere. That's the big thing in horses. Always has been, always will be. Why, you can see an atomic scientist staying up to 11 o'clock at night watching them horses run. You know, playing William Tell Overture? You know, he's sitting up there watching that thing like your life depended upon it. Some old, uh, some fellow is out in Beverly Hills, you know, drives Cadillac to work, gets one of those horses, and runs up and down uh, mes mesquite bushes outside of Los Angeles, taking his picture, but everybody watches it. Well, which one of you hasn't sat for about an hour and watched the... The uh, three musketeers, Athos, Porthos, and Aramis, and Gargan, tearing up and down the horses of the Scarlet Pimpernel, you know, or Seno de Bergerac, or Robin Hood, or Zorro, you know, in and out of the windows and on the horse. I mean, there's nothing to do. Occasionally, you watch a detective, you know, chasing somebody in a hot rod and dragging around Beverly Hills and up and down Berkeley, you know, and in those cars. But that isn't near exciting and them hoosh, hoosh, hitting the ground. And so horses figure, uh, there's a natural, physical little horse. Then there's a spiritual horse made of fire. Hence, a train is called an iron horse. And hence, any man outside this building has a car that says horsepower. See, you don't get away from that horse. This man drives a car in America that isn't hung up on horses. And so you've got a, you've got a physical, literal, visible horse. Then you've got a horse of fire. And that horse of fire takes Elijah up to heaven in 2 Kings chapter 2 and brings you back in Revelation 19. That's going to be a ride. Uh, you get on that thing up beyond Alpha Draconis, about 100 million light years up through Orion, and then you from, head from there down to the galaxies and constellations, and you land down here in about two and a half hours. That's horsepower, brother. That's horsepower, see? And you can move on to something there. And down at Cape Canaveral, you know, they'll still be trying to get a rocket up to Jupiter, Venus, you know, and messing around with the thing. And so those horses are spirit horses, and the horses of fire, two different kinds. What is the creation is the Lord's, including the horses. And if you've got a pet dog, give him to the Lord. Get him to put a collar on him and ride on the collar, holding this to the Lord. So with that thing there is, he says, without our dogs. You know, uh, Walter Wilson met a fellow of the Lord one time. You know how he did it? A fellow came to his meeting, and Wilson met him at the back door. The fellow had gland trouble. He weighed about 300 pounds. And 
Dr. Wall Wilson shook him by the hand and said, You from out of town? The fellow said, Yeah. And he said, uh, Did you enjoy the service tonight? The fellow said, Not particular. And start out. And he said, Well, would you do something for me when you get home? And the fellow said, I might. And Wilson said, Have you got a Bible at home? The fellow said, Yeah. He said, You know where Leviticus is in your Bible? And the fellow said, uh, Oh, yeah, sure, somewhere near the front. <laughs> and Wilson said, uh, Well, when you get home, would you look up Leviticus 3.16? And the fellow said, All right. And went home, looked up Leviticus 3.16. And then about two weeks later, he came back to that church, and Wilson wasn't there. Some of the preacher was there, and got saved. And sold out the Lord, made a real Christian. And later on, somebody asked him what, what in the world he had got on the conviction. And he said, well, did you ever read Leviticus 3.16? <laughs> Look at that last six words in there. What does it say? All the fat is the Lord. <laughs> That guy went home and read that thing, and he said, well, he said, if all the fat's the Lord's, then uh, I sure got a lot of it, so I'm going to give it to the Lord, 300 pounds of fat. 